Rub up your engines! Well, here's something you might not have thought of, but GM truck owners are going to end up paying more at the pump because of a computer chip shortage. Since GM doesn't have all the computer chips, especially the one that runs the fuel management module, a lot of the trucks are going to get worse gas mileage. You're going to pay for all the bells and whistles, but you're not going to get that chip that manages the gas mileage, so you're going to get worse gas mileage. All the money they're charging for the vehicles, and you're not even getting a 100% vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's GM for you. They're not, well, we can't build them. No, we'll build them. We'll leave some of the parts off. Man, I just couldn't resist that one, you know. Instead of trying to figure out a way to make it right and cut a deal with somebody, oh, we'll just leave that part off. <laughs> Be kind of like Homer Simpson building a car. Now, GM has already temporarily shut their factory in Kansas City, in Ontario, Canada, and in Mexico because they don't have the chips. So I guess they said, we can't do it anymore. We'll just build them with some of the parts not there. Well, that's GM for you. You know, I don't see Ford building them with some of the parts not on. <laughs> It is a competitive world, GM, realize that. And if you fail, hey, I just say, too bad. Let somebody else take your place. You know, the guys that made the horse and buggies when cars came, they went out of business. Well, maybe the guys that don't make the cars right and don't make the right decisions, maybe they should go out of business, too. Let somebody else take their place. Who knows what the heck they're doing. Joe says, what are your thoughts on LubeGuard products? LubeGuard Platinum ATF Protectant, LubeGuard Transmission Flush, and LubeGuard Instant Shutter Fix. Have you ever used these products? Would you do it before a costly re Build. Lou Gardner's been making stuff for years. I've used their stuff over the decades. Their shutter fix is actually a good product. Now, of course, if your automatic transmission is actually worn out inside and has serious problems, putting a liquid in isn't going to fix it. But Truthfully, I have had customers, especially with like a GM truck or a GM car that had a lot of shutter shifting, that I put a bottle of that stuff in and three, 400 miles later, sometimes the shutter went away completely and sometimes it got a little bit better. It isn't going to hurt anything. Now, you never want to overfill. So if you're putting in 12 ounces, first suck 12 ounces out of the transmission and then put the 12 ounces of the shutter fix in, whatever ounces in the bottle, put the same amount back in. It can work. They're good products. You know, they're not miracles. It's like anything else. Let's say you got a blown head gasket. You can try head gasket sealers. Some of them work for a while, especially the ones that have sodium silicate. It's a proven process. If you use them with just water, they'll clog up a lot of antifreeze. But if you use them pure water while they seal, they can work okay. But it's not a miracle. You got a big hole inside the engine. That little sealer ain't going to fix it. It just fix seeps and head gaskets and stuff. So it's worth trying. They are good products. And if it works, great. And if not, well, you know it's not working right anyway, and it's probably going to need to be overhauled. Os 350 three car says, I got an 07 Kia Rio with 140,000 miles. When I fill it up and it's problem starting after a few cranks and pumps to the gas pedal, it will start, but it flutters until I rev it up and it clears out. One of the most common things of that is a problem with your EVAP system, the anti-pollution system. When you fill up your car with gasoline, all the fuel vapors that are in the empty tank have to go somewhere. They're supposed to go through the EVAP system into the EVAP canister where the charcoal filters out the fumes and fresh air comes out. If that EVAP canister is bad or the EVAP canister vent valve is shut, then all of that vapor stay in the lines. Then when you start the car, it floods out because it's getting that extra fuel in it. And then the air that's getting sucked in isn't just air, it's air and gas fumes, and it will do exactly that. Pray it's that simple, because sometimes it's just old age, and when you fill up the car, your fuel injectors are kind of old, and then when you start it, they spray a little bit too much gas, and when you give it gas, it on floods it and rev it up, and then it runs normal. If it only happens when you fill it up, if it was a problem with the fuel injectors, it would also happen if you go on a highway and say eat lunch and then half an hour later you come back and try to start it and it does the same thing you got to rev it up then that's more likely fuel injectors leaking or something but if it only does it when you fill it up it's probably the evap canister or a bad evap canister vent valve letting the gasoline vapors get sucked into the engine which floods it out colonel x3 says i'm looking to purchase a used honda crv from a private seller i've heard the ac compressors go bad and throw metal in the ac how extensive is the problem if i were buying a used crv could i expect to replace it again okay here Here's the thing. What generally happens is Honda never made their own air conditioning compressors, and they've tried various companies to buy them from. Now, Toyota was smarter. They almost always stuck to Nip and Denso, so they had a good relationship with Nip and Denso, so they would make the compressors that would fit the Toyota designs quite well. Well, Honda kept going around with different companies, so they've had a lot of problems over the years. And on the CRVs, the problem was when the company made the compressors, they cheaped out. The compressor has a clutch on the 
again. When you turn the electricity on, it makes the clutch get magnetic and it pulls in and it spins the compressor on a shaft. Well, the shaft used to be real thick and whatever company they bought it from, they decided, let's make the shaft a lot thinner. It's cheaper to build them that way. Yes, it is. And guess what happened? The shafts are too thin and they snapped off. But here's the main thing the shafts snap off and what happens is the front of the clutch flies off and goes down a road I've seen it happen to a lot of them but it generally doesn't affect the interior of the compressor because it just snaps the shaft off and if that's the case there's no metal inside the AC system and all you got to do is replace the compressor and the dryer it's not that bad of a deal now if it blows up internally yes but from my experience it's just the shaft and the end snaps off you got to buy a new compressor and if you're looking at a used one it might have had it replaced already ask them has it been replaced and they have paperwork and if they do you don't have to worry about it because you can get newer compressors that are made better that aren't as skinny as that it's just a flaw that Honda made a mistake they kept buying them from different companies and then they bought them from the company that made crappy ones for those Joey says should I get repairs done or save the money for another car I got a 2009 Camry bought it new it's 12 years old and it's 45,000 miles I had the following stuff done last year resurfaced rear rotors replaced rear brake pads replaced front rotors replaced front brake pads tire rotation replaced power steering return tube due to power steering fluid should I get rid of this car or continue to fix it? They now say, oh, the radiator's leaking and other items. They want 2,500 bucks. Well, one, forget them and go to a mechanic like me. They've been ripping you off. That car's only got 45,000 miles on it. Let me tell you, half the stuff they've done probably didn't need doing. 45,000 miles. I got 200,000 miles out of the brake rotors on my Toyota Celica. They're selling you stuff you probably don't even need. And now they're saying, you need this, you need that. I wouldn't believe them. Now, okay let's say the radiator is leaking forget them who knows what the truth is go to a guy like me pressure test it if it's leaking then you say okay we'll replace the radiator but the dealer is going to hit you high and low okay for that particular car you know what I pay for a radiator I buy a radiator for that car for $119 and it takes about 40 minutes to put on so it's not even a $200 job right and they're probably charging you $800 at the dealer go somewhere else where you get a better price and where people are honest because they always want to sell you stuff that's a Camry they can last three four five hundred thousand miles and you've only got 40 5,000 miles on it. Don't waste your money on another car and don't pay 2,500 bucks with them. Find a guy like me, a real independent mechanic who cares, that'll do business with you and say, that's a great car. Don't get rid of that thing. I'm surprised they didn't tell you, oh, why don't you buy a new one? Yours is worn out. That's generally what they say at the dealer. It's 12 years old. Oh, it's old. You need a new one. <laughs> No, you don't. It's only got 45,000 miles. It's not even broken in yet. Well, here's an ode to American dinosaurs. The American giant classic cars. You don't see them anymore because everything's being shrunk. But the big old Cadillac with the fins on them. Just monstrosity cars. You know, they start at 212 inches long and they get even bigger. The 1963 Dodge Custom 880. It was 214 inches long. Even the Dodge Charger, the original ones were big. They were 216 inches long, but they only sold 31,000 of them. The, contrary to what a lot of people don't realize, they didn't actually sell that many of them. And one of my favorites, the Buick Riviera that was 217 inches long. I like those. Those were cool cars. You ever saw that old movie Dennis Hopper the slick guy driving the Riviera I always liked those Rivieras I thought they were cool and then if you really want to go back to 69 Dodge Polaro that was 220 inches long another monster car it was as long as a 59 New Yorker town and country station wagon which was 220 inches long they used to make cars gigantic Chevrolet Impala was 221.9 inches long we had one as a kid and let me tell you it was sailing a ship on the ocean when you corner you kind of pointed and let it wallow back and forth and those giant bench seats in the front did you be sliding back and forth like a living room couch driving down a road <laughs> they ate up a lot of gas too but man you felt safe inside them they were so huge and they did have seat belts and perhaps one of the longest cars ever made the 1969 Imperial Le Baron. That was almost 230 inches long, 229.7 inches. Had a big old 440 big block V8 engine, 7.2 liters. And back in those days, 350 horsepower was a lot, but you do have to consider it was pulling this gigantic car around too. It wasn't like a little bitty thing. It was in a giant monster car that you could fit your family in and point it down the road as you drove it. Other uh, suspension and steering, really not all that accurate, but they were big. Whopping gigantic hunks of steel and iron to go rolling down the road when gasoline was cheap and you could camp out inside your car if you really had to <laughs> so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos 
Remember to ring that bell!